The examination of Pavel continues this morning. The prosecution put up a picture of the Ford seats that were in the Tacoma originally that had been removed. And if you'll recall, on the one seat, the entire seat cover had been removed. Yesterday, Pavel had explained this by saying, well, he was having trouble with them. So he took the seat cover off and took the foam off because he was working with tools and he didn't want to start a fire. So he was very clear about which side of the vehicle that was and what he was doing and why he had removed that seat cover. It was quite a detailed explanation. Today, the prosecution puts up a picture of those seats, one with the cover removed, and asks Pavel, can you please point out which one is the driver's seat and which one is the passenger seat? And you know Pavel couldn't do it. That's weird. Pavel testified that he, when he went with Fotis to Mountain Springs, when Fotis was driving the Tacoma, that was only once. They showed video that we've seen before, and they go through the timeline of when people came in and when they left, and they were asking, you know, who's driving. Then they showed a photo of Pavel's Tacoma that was caught on surveillance. Do you remember that photo with what appeared to be a bicycle in the bed of the truck? That one. And the prosecution zoomed in on that. And he asked Pavel, first he says, is this your truck? How do you know? Or is this consistent with your truck? How do you know? Pavel says, yes, it's his truck. And the prosecution says, well, were you driving it on May 24th? And Pavel says, no. The prosecution points out the object in the truck bed. The prosecution asked, when Pavel dropped off the Tacoma before the 24th, if there was anything in the bed of the truck. And Pavel says, except for things I used to tie down my dirt bike and some bungee cords, no. Then they show the receipt that Pavel got from the gas station on the 24th. And they talk about whose credit card it was on. And you can see that there was 22.6 gallons of gasoline purchased. The prosecution is able to bring out that Pavel's Tacoma will only take about 17 gallons. So no one can argue, oh, that receipt is not for the Raptor, it's for the Tacoma. It's for the Raptor, or at least, at the very least, not for the Tacoma. So obviously they're showing, look, Pavel wasn't driving the Tacoma. On May 24th at 4.58 p.m., the Raptor is shown on surveillance video with a 2 by 10 board sticking out of the back. Well, this is the board that Pavel had picked up at Deer Cliff, and it just corroborates that part of his story. Pavel said that he left 80 Mountain Springs before Michelle and Fotis, and they show video of everybody coming out and what time they left. What he says here is not inconsistent with what he has said before. It just makes it a little more clear. And it is consistent with what Michelle has said before. Fotis and Pavel return to 80 Mountain Springs and the Raptor. And Pavel says Michelle returned. Now, this is the part where Pavel was saying, oh, Fotis says that Michelle had the key and so Michelle has to come back. And she did. But then it was Fotis who gave Pavel back the key to the Tacoma, not Michelle. But the surveillance video does show another vehicle returning. And Pavel says, well, that must have been Michelle. So it again corroborates a portion of Pavel's statement. Then you see a photograph of the Tacoma with the dirt bike in the back. So the prosecution's just laying down these facts so that if anybody doubts or it tries to argue those pieces, the prosecution is proving every little element that they can. The prosecution asked about Fotis's bicycle and showed Pavel a picture of the garage at Fort Jefferson. And the prosecution suggests that, well, this bike is missing from the garage. And Pavel says, could it be the one at the top? But I think he was actually talking about the hooks or the mounts on the wall as opposed to pointing out a bicycle that's on the wall. 
The prosecution had no more questions. It was time for the cross-examination. The defense pointed out that in December 2023, Pavel received a written agreement for immunity, and the defense says to Pavel, you can't be prosecuted. And then brings out the fact that in 2019, the former state's attorney had given Pavel immunity verbally, as long as he cooperated with the investigation and the prosecution. It's only then that Pavel agrees, well, yeah, actually, they did tell me that. The defense challenges him a little bit, saying, hey, the first time that you mentioned that statement of Michelle, he's referring to the negative statement that Pavel says Michelle made after Jennifer's disappearance. And the defense says, hey, the first time you ever mentioned this statement is in 2024. Did you not remember the statement before? Did you just suddenly remember five years later? At this point, the prosecution stood up and objected, but he was overruled. So Pavel is sort of not really clear. And then it, it comes out, he finally agrees that it was when Pavel got a call from the state's attorney's office in 2024, saying to him, you have something to add. Pavel never gave this statement in writing or on any recording before. The defense sort of delves further into when this statement was allegedly made by Michelle and the circumstances and all of that. Pavel had said it was when we were, I was helping her bring firewood up to the house. The defense is trying to sort of let, set the stage or lay the groundwork for this and saying, okay, you knew they had firewood. You knew they used a fireplace. You knew they had wood stacked up along the side of the house. This shouldn't have been any kind of issue. Pavel seemed to sort of gloss over and avoid whether they were using a wheelbarrow or not. And then he's saying he can't remember whether there was wood, whether Fotis and Michelle had wood stacked up beside the house, which I just thought was a bizarre lapse of memory. This would be a thing that he saw all the time. So it would be weird for him to not remember that. I don't have any conclusion about that. I just noted it was strange. Pavel ended up admitting, and I don't think he knew this is the road he was going down. But anyway, Pavel admitted that he did the searches on his phone on the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. But he says he doesn't remember the stories connecting, trying to connect Fotis and Michelle to the disappearance. It also came out that in this same conversation or in this, in Pavel's understanding of where Michelle was coming from was that Michelle had said, Jennifer is playing games. And it, the word is, was stressed by defense counsel, which I thought was a good way to make a point without coming out and saying it. And when Jennifer shows up, and then Pavel admits that he also thought that Jennifer was going to turn up. He also thought that Jennifer was playing games and that she just run off and was hiding. And Pavel also thought that this is a thing that Jennifer had done before because Pavel also believed Fotis's stories about Jennifer. I find this very interesting. It's no surprise that he would believe these things. I mean, it sounds like Fotis was a master manipulator and gaslighter of everybody around him. And the people in Fotis's orbit would be constantly getting the same message, which is whatever message that Fotis wants them to get, right? Michelle did not know Jennifer personally. Pavel did. Yet Pavel still believed Fotis' stories about Jennifer. And I want to make it clear that when I'm talking about 
whether or not people believe these stories or what the stories were, I am not in any way suggesting that any of Fotis's stories about Jennifer are true. This is about how this, I'm going to say it, abuser, because he was Fotis, right? This abuser manipulated, he vilified the victim, and that's what they do, right? And gets everybody around him. He has his flying monkeys. He gets everybody around him to believe this narrative about the victim. Those of you who have dealt with narcissists or flying monkeys or had stories told about you will know how difficult this would have been for Jennifer. And it's quite the head trip for everybody around Fotis because they're believing all kinds of things that just aren't true. And I point this out, the fact that Pavel believed that Jennifer was just playing games and that Jennifer would show up because at least in the general public, from what I've seen, there seems to be a double standard. People get angry at Michelle for believing Fotis's stories, but when other people around Fotis believe his stories, somehow that's okay. The prosecution itself is putting up this witness who believed Fotis's stories, and that same prosecution will treat Michelle in a different light, but she's doing the same thing as everybody else. And I mean in, in respect to what she believes or what she thinks or what her perception is or why she didn't see signs and all of that. The defense brought out that Pavel helped Jennifer move and hid that fact from Fotis. So the defense brings out that Fotis's dog, this lab who had to be euthanized, was a much loved dog, that the children had grown up with this dog, that the dog was came to the office. The defense was asking Pavel, well, when you took the dog to the vet, don't you remember that Michelle's father also went with you to the vet. Well, Pavel didn't remember that. But Pavel does remember that Fotis was really upset that the kids couldn't see the dog one last time. Pavel said that Michelle's remark at that time in that context, Pavel saw it as a way to cheer up Fotis. So the defense says, so it was a joke, a sick joke, but it was a joke, right? And Pavel saying, no, not a joke. My sense is, so this is my opinion, but my sense is that there's a language, there was a language issue happening here and cheer up might not have been the word that Pavel meant. I mean, if you look at it from a native English speaker's perspective, a better word might have been commiserate or validate, something like that. And I think Pavel just didn't have the word for it. Pavel learned Jennifer was missing on the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. And Pavel admits that it was then, on the Sunday, that he started doing searches on his phone about Jennifer's disappearance. Then the defense says, oh, were you curious about the investigation? And Pavel skirts this. He says, I wanted to know what was going on. It's an understandable answer, and he doesn't quite fall into the trap that the defense just set there. Then he admits he's actually not sure which day he saw Fotis and Michelle in the kitchen, that day that Fotis looked at Pavel's phone. And the defense was asking, but this was not the same day as the Tacoma was taken to the car wash. And Pavel doesn't remember. Pavel doesn't recall if he went to New Canaan on the Tuesday after the crime. But then he says, yes, he did. And he had the white Jeep. Then this thing about the dirt bike came out. Previous testimony from Pavel was that he purchased the dirt bike from Michelle. The way that came out, to be fair to Pavel here, was that the prosecution said, isn't it true that you purchased this dirt bike from Michelle? And the answer was yes. 
So this wasn't a narrative that Pavel came out with. It was an agreement with a statement that was being made to him. Well, today it comes out that Pavel paid Foda's money for that dirt bike, not Michelle, even though the bike was Michelle's, it was registered to Michelle. And even though dirt bikes are supposed to be registered, he didn't register this. And so Michelle never got any money for this bike. I don't know if she knew that Pavel gave Foda's money for it or what. But at some point, Michelle is saying, I want my dirt bike back from Pavel. He has my dirt bike. Eventually, Pavel ended up having to return the dirt bike. And then they go back to this conversation in the kitchen. And suddenly, Pavel doesn't remember how long it was. Then they get into photos and this asking people to make a timeline. The defense sort of reinforces Pavel's previous testimony that Pavel had said to Fotis, I don't need a timeline because I'll remember what I was doing. But now, you know, he doesn't remember anything. And now, today, Pavel doesn't agree that Fotis was pressing him in respect to this timeline. Pavel says, well, Fotis said that a lawyer suggested it. And this might not seem like a big deal, but there's some nuance here, and it does matter how things are characterized, right? The defense starts asking about Kent McWinney. Pavel said he never met Kent. He didn't know Kent was a lawyer of photos. And the defense is doing this sort of, it's pretty conversational. It's not this high drama you see on TV. So the witness doesn't clue in on what's happening. That's a great trick of lawyers and detectives. Anyway, then it comes out, well, in 2016... Pavel might have heard about Kent back then. In fairness to Pavel here, though, it's 2016 and it might have been a conversation about this Kent guy. It's not like they met and had lunch together or something like this. So it would be an easy thing to forget or not be sure about. The defense put up a picture of Fotis' dog, that lab who passed away. And the prosecution objected. So while they're arguing back and forth about this objection, the defense is forced into a position where he has to explain to the judge in front of the witness that his purpose for this has to do with the fact that because the dog had had blood work, that there could be animal blood in the back of the Suburban. We're talking about Fotis's Suburban. Well, The prosecution objected again about that. After more back and forth, the judge decides that the defense is allowed to ask the question. Pavel has heard all of this arguing, so he knows what the issue is. So he has recalled previously that, yeah, he took this dog to the vet. But now he doesn't recall whether or not it was the Suburban that he took the dog in. He finally says, okay, I won't deny it. Then the prosecution gets up and objects and just gives this laundry list of objections and is overruled. The defense brings out that this conversation with Michelle about the dog having to be euthanized and her awful remarks at that time took place around Greek Easter, which was also in April, and that corresponds to the time that the dog had to be put down, and so that's all sort of corroborated, right? Pavel doesn't remember the dog coming back from the vet, and then the defense just sort of left that there. He moved on to 2016, when Pavel started working on the books for Forgroup. But prior to that, Pavel had worked as a subcontractor. And the defense says, oh, so you were working before you got your green card. And Pavel says yes. And it was good he answered yes, because it would have been really easy to impeach him on that. I think the defense is trying to plant the seed here that maybe you're not this as honest as you say. I think that by answering yes... Pavel did himself a favor. It's always better to say the truth, even if it's embarrassing, even if it makes you look bad, than it is to say a lie. It came out that Pavel knew Fotis for several years prior to ever working for him. 
since 2004 or 2005. Also, it came out that Pavel did chores or odd jobs for Fotis, like mowing the lawn, bringing in firewood, fixing things in and around the house. And again, the defense didn't make any conclusion. It's just out there. He's just getting this stuff out there. Pavel agreed that his work schedule depended on the kind of project he was working on. And Pavel agreed that his hours were pretty flexible. Pavel had previously said he did not socialize with Fotis and Michelle, but the defense was able to bring out that he had gone to dinner parties at Fotis's and Michelle's house. Pavel agreed that Fotis liked to cook, and they talked about the workspace at the office. Pavel had his own workspace and keys, Pavel didn't have to go through the residence, and other employees of Four Group didn't have to go through the residence in order to get to the office. And I think the point, or part of the point here is, and I could be wrong, but I think this is about how would you know who's there and who's not if they don't have to go through the house? And he didn't want to, but he eventually admitted, yeah, he talks to photos pretty much every day, every work day. And it's not always by phone. Sometimes it's text. He agreed that sometimes Fotis traveled. He was not always at the office and that the children water skied. Pavel knew who Hutch was. Now Hutch is the owner at the pond. Pavel knew what the pond was. Then the defense was asking about sort of the setup at the office. The defense suggested to Pavel, you could be at the office all day long and not know who else was there. Is that correct? And Pavel agreed with that. Pavel also agreed that mostly people park in the back. I think this is an important point that the defense is bringing out. The idea is, look, you don't know who's there. So you could assume that somebody's present or assume that they're not present. And so you think someone's there and they're not. Or you think someone's not there and they are. And I think that's the point. It can be very easy to be wrong about that. The defense brought out that the first time Pavel talked to the police was on May 31st. And that was when the police stopped him outside of Fort Jefferson Crossing. Remember, he had, Pavel had driven up with the Jeep, saw the police, saw all the vehicles there and all the people standing around. And so he kept going and then he came back and the police eventually stopped him. Pavel denied that he knew that these were police. So then the defense is saying, well, then why did you keep driving by? Why didn't you just go in to the office? And yesterday, Pavel had said, oh, I didn't want to bother anybody. He'd said that when the prosecution was examining him. But if that's the case, then why turn around and drive back, right? Why keep going by? So he was full of it yesterday. And I think the defense was trying to bring that out. So Pavel's sitting there trying to deny that he had any idea that these were police officers. And the defense asks, well, weren't they wearing vests that say police on them? And Pavel says he doesn't, he doesn't know. He didn't notice. And then the defense says, well, when you were stopped by police, did you know there were police? And Pavel says he didn't. And so the defense says, what, you just stop for random strangers? And so Pavel eventually concedes, yeah, they're police, but doesn't quite concede that he knew it for sure. The defense suggests that the reason Pavel didn't stop is because he didn't want to talk to police. He challenged Pavel, questioning why he told the police what he did. When the officers who stopped Pavel asked him, where are you coming from? What were you doing? Where have you been? Instead of saying that he'd come from Deercliff, moving seats, instead of describing all these junkyards that he had been to, because he'd been traveling around all over the place, going to junkyards, going to a body shop, looking for seats, all this, all that was after He'd been at the job site. 
in New Canaan. But what he told police was, oh, I'm coming from a job site in New Canaan. So clearly that is a lie, or at the very least, a pretty significant omission. And why would you do that? Why would you think of your job site that was hours before and not where you just were, which is what they were asking? While the defense is trying to impeach Pavel, basically, the prosecution was object and saying it's not relevant. Well, the defense says, well, it's within the scope of the direct examination. The defense asked Pavel if he gave the police permission to search his person. Pavel doesn't remember. And I find this interesting because he remembers Oh, I gave permission for my phone. I gave permission for this, that, and the other thing. When it comes to a pat down, wouldn't you remember whether that was done against your will or not? And the defense brought out that it wasn't until the police challenged Pavel about where he'd been, saying, look, you're all, why are you all sweaty? Come on, where have you been really? That Pavel then admitted, well, I was over here getting these Porsche seats. He left out all of the trips to the junkyards and everything else. The defense said, well, why did you leave all that out? And Pavel's answer? Well, nobody asked. Well, actually, they did ask. Where are you coming from? Where have you been? Where have you just been? And he gives them an answer on where he'd been hours before. This is a concern for credibility to an extent, because he's splitting hairs. Well, I didn't really lie. Technically, I told the truth. That kind of thing, that's always worrisome. Then he was questioned about Sunday, June 2nd. Pavel said that he gave permission for the police to take his phone. When the defense is asking him about this, the prosecution's standing up to object. But the defense is trying to impeach the witness, and this is part of the purpose of cross-examination. The defense suggests that the police told Pavel if he didn't give consent for the police to download his phone, it would be months before he could get that phone back. And it was only then that Pavel said, well, okay, you can have it. And the prosecution objected to this. Then Pavel says he's not sure if he gave permission before or after that conversation about how long it would take to get his phone back. Pavel kept adding that he was going to give permission or he did give permission, but then he called his lawyer because he wanted to make sure that it was going to be okay, but he had nothing to hide. The defense questioned him about June 2nd. On June 2nd, the police wanted to take the Jeep Cherokee that was in Pavel's possession at his home. Pavel said he doesn't recall whether or not he already knew Fotis had been arrested. And he doesn't recall refusing to let the police take the Jeep. The defense got into June 6th. That was when the police wanted Pavel to take them out to Powerline Trail to show them that motorcycle route. And the defense got into this whole thing about, well, that trail, on that trail, there's large large gravel, right? There are some steep places. You need a vehicle that has wide tires to navigate that well. And Pavel was sort of going along with that, except for the steep places. And Pavel was saying, oh, but there's no steep places. And that ended up being clarified. And he agreed, yeah, there are steep places, but those steep places don't have gravel on them. Then the defense goes to, well, on that day when you're going to show police that, and knowing you're going to show police that trail, which vehicle did you take? Well, Pavel... Instead of taking the Tacoma, which is an all-wheel drive, he takes his wife's sedan. And at the time, the police even suggested to him, well, don't you want to take your truck, given the kind of terrain we're going to be going over? Nope. He takes his wife's sedan. 
The defense talked about the reservoir parking area and the utility entrance and that the police and Pavel parked there. And I'm not sure where he was going with that. So I only mention it here because it was said and somebody who actually lives in that area might clue into why that might be important or if the defense was sort of planting seeds here. I'm not sure. They moved on to the June 6th interview with Pavel, which is the same day as they took the Tacoma. And Pavel saying, well, he didn't recall. Well, he's not even recalling the, that he was interviewed by police. Then it comes out, Pavel says, well, he met with the police more than five times. So he can't remember which thing he said in which interview. In any case, he agreed that at various times, police had asked Pavel about Fotis's and Pavel's whereabouts on May 24th. He also agreed that he told police that he liked Fotis, that Fotis was a good boss, that he respected Fotis, that Fotis was nice. And I'm just going to stop for a second and talk about nice. Nice is not a character trait. It's a behavior. How many times have you heard somebody seen someone on the news talking about some horrible crime and saying, but, but he was such a nice guy. Nice doesn't mean anything. It's a behavior. And you know, we all know that Fotis wore a mask. He managed people's perceptions. But it goes to Pavel's state of mind. He thought Fotis was a nice guy. And the other thing I'll mention here, just in fairness to Pavel, is that nobody wants to believe that someone in their orbit could commit a horrendous crime, even when the evidence is staring them in the face. And the ins and outs of that are a whole other conversation. Police had asked Pavel about Fotis and what he knew about the divorce proceedings between Jennifer and Fotis. The defense suggests that Pavel knew that Jennifer was planning on leaving Fotis and Pavel kept that from Fotis. Pavel says, well, he's not sure if he really knew that or not. Pavel doesn't recall telling police about how Fotis complained about how long the divorce was taking. The defense got Pavel to agree that Pavel believed that things were going well for Fotis with the divorce and custody. And this issue of this psychologist's report was brought up. The prosecution objected. The prosecution objected to the questioning. But the judge said it was important, but the defense needs to show the witness statement first. Pavel was hedging and saying, I don't recall, and there were prior inconsistent statements. And the judge said, look, you got to show him his statement before you can start saying that you're impeaching him. So the defense shows Pavel the transcript of his statement to police, but then the prosecution was sort of playing dumb. Well, sorry, Your Honor, I don't recall he was trying to sort of pry open a door through which he could squeeze through and object again and stop the defense, but he was unsuccessful. Pavel then got to read a part of his transcript of his statement to police. And then it comes out that the report from the psychologist was favorable to Fotis. At least that's what Pavel believed. That's what Fotis wants people to believe. We don't know. And we may never know whether that report was in fact favorable to Fotis or if that was just Fotis saying things. But the reason it matters is because the state of mind or the belief of the, the people involved is important here. What they think is true is important in assessing their motives and their actions and that sort of thing, even if the thing they think is true isn't true. And I suspect that where the defense is going with 
all of this is to suggest that, look, Forrest didn't have a motive. Things were going well. He had no reason to do this. He was close to the end, close to getting everything he wanted. I am going to suggest that this point that the defense is trying to make, even if they make the point, even if they're right that things were going well and all that, I don't think that carries as much weight or should carry as much weight as people might think. And here's why. First of all, the prosecution does not have to prove motive. Also, this is Michelle's trial, not Fotis's trial. But also, sometimes you'll see DV, I'm talking about lethal stuff, at the time when things seem to be going okay, but everything is coming to an end. People's motives run deeper than just money or just revenge or just being mad about a specific thing. These guys who are used to getting everything they want, who are angry. Fotis doesn't like to be told no. The finality of the divorce, regardless of how it turns out, would be a precipitating factor to put into all the tumblers that have to fall into place. So that it was going well doesn't necessarily mean that he had no motive. Because it's all much more complex than that. And the other thing that we learned today that I didn't realize is that the dog being sick and dying, this beloved dog, this happened in April around Greek Easter. And when Fotis went to Jennifer's house on the 22nd, he brought with him Easter chocolate for the kids. These kids who weren't allowed to go to Fotis's Greek Easter celebration. So we've got that this divorce is becoming, is well on its way to being done, regardless of the outcome. The kids don't get to say goodbye to their beloved dog. Fotis loses his dog. Fotis doesn't get to have his kids for Greek Easter, which is important to him. And you're compounding all these things. When we look at threat assessment, we look at stressors. And stressors aren't necessarily motive, but you know, you get all these precipitating factors and all these stressors adding up and adding up and adding up. We also know that according to Michelle's statement to police, he hadn't been sleeping well. So he was staying up late at night. He was getting up really early in the morning. So all this is coming to a head in Fotis's mind. This has nothing to do with Pavel or Michelle or anybody. This is Fotis messed up. And all this stuff is adding up. And he is vengeful. And he is controlling. And he is possessive. And all those things. And it's all coming to a head. And then he's got these extra stresses. That's not an excuse by any means. Don't misunderstand. And precipitating factor does not mean cause. Okay, there's a big difference. And I know a lot of you know that, but some people don't, which is why I'm saying it. Okay, back to this testimony. The defense moved on to questions about the Tacoma. He brings out that Pavel bought the Tacoma used. The Ford seats were put into the Tacoma soon after he bought it, and that would have been 2012. Pavel did work for Fotis when Pavel had his own company. He visited Fort Jefferson Crossing, and Pavel visited Fort Jefferson Crossing at that time. In fact, Pavel said he'd been there even before that. Pavel did the framing at Fort Jefferson Crossing when it was being built, and He knew Jennifer even before that. They talked about the Tacoma and the leaking oil. The garage at Fort Jefferson Crossing was stained because of Tacoma oil. That's what the defense suggests. Pavel says, I assume that's the case. The defense gets into the condition of this Tacoma. 
The shock absorbers were shot. The truck was not reliable. Pavel had to do this trick with the key to get it to start. Pavel even told the police when they were seizing the Tacoma that, look, it's not reliable to get you to New Canaan. And the defense moved on from that for a second and went into May 23rd. Pavel drove into Mountain Springs with the Raptor. Fotis parked the Tacoma facing outwards. Pavel doesn't remember how he turned the Raptor around. I suspect that all this positioning of all the vehicles is going to come up later somehow. And the defense asks, well, why didn't you drive your own truck to 80 Mountain Springs? Why is Fotis driving your truck and you're driving the Raptor? And Pavel didn't really have an answer. Then it comes out that for more than a month, Pavel had been researching trucks on Craigslist, that he'd been planning on selling his truck and buying a new one. The defense put up searches, pictures of different trucks that were found on Pavel's phone, showing that he was indeed researching getting another truck. These searches precede May 24th, but were as near to the date of May 24th as May 18th and May 21st. Also afterwards, on May 26th and May 31st, Pavel had been searching new trucks. And Pavel admitted that, well, yeah, actually he did tell Fotis this around this time. But that's only after the defense pushed. First, Pavel said, well, it's possible, it's possible, it's possible. But then he has to admit it. And I note his demeanor during much of Cross, especially around this issue. Pavel's sitting there with his arms crossed. We didn't see that through the direct examination. So this issue of characterizing something in two different ways. Pavel was planning on selling his truck and getting a new one anyway. And Fotis knew this. On the one hand, you could characterize this as, well, Fotis knew this and that's why he's saying, well, then lower the price on the truck and just get rid of it. It's a piece of crap. You could argue that Fotis was being helpful. You could also argue that Fotis was taking advantage of a situation that was already there. He was taking advantage of Pavel's plans and wants. And you've seen people like that. They see an opportunity and they jump on that and try and leverage it to get what they want. The defense pointed out that this area of the power line trails also includes an area for regular hikers. And Pavel says, he doesn't know about that because he doesn't, he's not a hiker. I think there's a reason why the defense is bringing that up. He sort of mentioned it before. The defense asked Pavel, well, you often took your, you often took a four group vehicle home with you on the weekend. And Pavel was pretty consistent with this. Pavel said, no, not often. It's not often. Did it happen sometimes? Yes. Not often. Yesterday, Pavel had testified to the fact that one of Fotis's lawyers had spoken with him and made mention of his green card and that he shouldn't call police. And today, the defense was asking him about that. And Pavel says, no, 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 that was Fotis. I don't recall saying that. That was Fotis who said that to me, not the lawyer. The defense points out to Pavel, hey, the police said things to you about your green card. And Pavel is saying, oh, I don't recall until the defense reads from the transcript of the police interview with Pavel. And of course, the prosecution is up, objection, and is overruled. Turns out that the police were saying, hey, the police were talking to Pavel about his immigration status and making Pavel nervous about that. The police brought this up to him. This little piece of information is, again, important when it comes to characterization because the prosecution would have you not know about the part where the police scared Pavel. They just want you to know about the part where Fotis scared Pavel. It doesn't mean that Fotis didn't do that. 
But, you know, if you're going to judge someone or characterize something in a certain way, you can't have it both ways. You can't have one standard for one and, and another for another. So the police had also caused Pavel to be nervous about his status. And by the way, today we learned that Pavel has since become a U.S. citizen. The defense got into June 12th when Pavel went to the Litchfield Police Barracks. Pavel thought that he was going there to pick up the Tacoma. And the defense put up a picture of Pavel in a police interview room holding a can of oil. Pavel, thinking he was getting the Tacoma, brought a can of oil with him because he knew that it was dripping a lot and it would need to be replenished before he could drive it. Anyway, the police plan was never to give Pavel that Tacoma back anyway, so they ended up trying to question him, but Pavel said, no, 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 I want my attorney present, and so the police stopped the interview at that time. The video is getting too long, so I'm going to have to divide this into two. This is the end of this morning's testimony. I'll work on this afternoon's. Trust your gut. I'll see you in the comments.